the Unleash Success Podcast, where we break down the secrets of success to give you real tools and strategies that get real results. And now, here's your host, Corey Corpodian. Welcome back to Unleash Success. This is your host, Corey Corpodian. Holy shit, guys. We are on episode 50. Five, zero. Some of you know I made a commitment when I first started podcasting that I would release 100 episodes. And I started that off mainly because they said you'd fail if you didn't release at least eight. So before I even started, I recorded eight episodes. And I said, listen, I want to make sure that I do this full out. So I just committed to doing 100 episodes, one a week. And I figured that would take me about two years. But if you want to help me make that 100 episode commitment into maybe 200 episodes, or maybe even a 1,000, the best way you can help is by sharing this podcast. Share it with friends. Share it on social media. We're available on you know iPhones and Android alike. Uh, we're relaunching on YouTube. If you want to check us out on Spotify or iTunes, I definitely appreciate it. And really, guys, sharing this podcast is the only way we can keep it growing and the only way I can continue to keep doing this. Um, but I absolutely do love it, and I've learned a lot. In 50 episodes, I've interviewed some amazing men and women who have a great background in business and entrepreneurship, some who have taught us about how to be a better person, a better human being, and still others who have taught us how to really master our fitness and our health. And in today's episode, we're going to go through a couple highlights. You know, I couldn't possibly fit all the amazing guests into one episode. And I just grabbed some that kind of stood out. And not really because necessarily they were the best of the best, but they also told a story. Because I feel like a lot of us out there are, you know, struggling with something in our life. And we don't quite know how to tackle it. And so I want to get started with the mindset. What is the mindset for success? You know, I believe you got to train that mindset daily. And I believe that certain language you use, the words that you say to yourself, and the questions you ask yourself, and the habits you have really develop that mindset. And one thing that I'm so passionate about is developing the champion's mindset. A champion, what is a champion to you? To me, a champion is someone who goes boldly after their goals, someone who never gives up, no matter how many times they fail, someone who is willing to put in the work, someone who believes that they can accomplish anything as long as they're willing to work for it. And so I thought, who better than four-time Mr. Olympia physique champion Jeremy Buendia to tell us where he learned his hard work ethic, his champion mindset from. And so here's a clip from episode 17. As far as getting bodybuilding, I mean, I played sports all my life, so my dad trained me for these sports. You know, that was always the most prepared athlete all the time. I remember I was like seven or eight years old getting ready for my first football season. My brother's seven years older than me, played ball, played ball also. And my first football season was three months before trials. My dad had me getting up in the morning running wind sprints. And I was like, why am I running? We don't even stop for three months. Yeah. Well, when everybody else is getting, try to be getting in shape at tryouts, you're already going to be in shape and you're going to beat the front of the line running. When Absolutely. You're, when you're running wind sprints, you're already going to be ahead of everybody. And that's kind of been the mentality. You know, that's the way I was brought up. We still always be a step ahead. Always be prepared. Always make sure you're doing more. And, you know, that's just the mentality I've always had since growing up. You know, I, I had a lot of repercussions from you know, my peers because of how hard I worked, you know, almost like they call me a coach, you know, a kiss ass or coach's pet or whatnot, because after practice, you know, I would run extra sprints, you know, people would they get mad because I would try to make them look bad or no, it was because I'm trying to be better than everybody else. And if yeah. you don't like my hard work and my effort, that's on you. There is just no substitute guys for hard work. You heard it from the champ himself. He didn't win four years in a row. He wasn't the Mr. Olympia physique champion four years in a row because he didn't have a solid work ethic. And I love what he said there. He wanted to be the most prepared person. What are you doing right now to become the most prepared person? What are you doing day in and day out to put in that hard work? Listen, guys, if you want to be a champion in anything, 
It requires a lot of hard work. And so for this next clip, I want to take you way back to episode number five with Tom Bilyeu, who is the co-founder of Quest Nutrition, valued at over a billion dollars, people. And now he's the founder and host of Impact Theory, which is an amazing, empowering show. He also founded Impact Theory Comics. Incredible. This guy just does not stop. And one of his missions is to help people Break out of the matrix, which is something I can so relate to because I always viewed the only limit in the world as our own mindset, as our own beliefs. And so we jump into how to develop beliefs, how to shift beliefs, what beliefs should we adopt to become a better person. I give you Tom Bilyeu. Our mindset is based on beliefs and beliefs are a construct that we can change. I'm curious, what's one belief that you have or that you changed from a young kid to where you are now? The most important is just the very notion that you can get better. And I just believe that there were, you could get better at the technical side, but I never believed you could get better at talent. Mm-hmm. Um, that was huge, utterly transformative. Now, everybody says that one, so I'll give you one that's more unique. What you build your self-esteem around matters. And I used to build my self-esteem around the idea of being smart and right. And that's very fragile because inevitably you're going to meet people smarter than you and you're going to be wrong a lot more than you are right. So if you're building your self-esteem around those two things, you're going to end up feeling badly about yourself, which is why after film school, I felt terrible because I realized I wasn't talented. And I thought that that was an indictment of who I not only was, but who I could be and that it was a, a permanent state. I failed and was a failure. So in that, You just get caught in these loops of wanting to put yourself in smaller and smaller arenas so that you're always the smartest. You're always right more than anybody else. And in doing that, you're never going to have the kind of success you want. So I had these goals. They were very big, very ambitious, but my my actions weren't backing them up because my identity, my self-esteem, my pride was all around something that was forcing me in the opposite direction. So People don't commit suicide because they fail. They commit suicide because they believe that they're a failure and that they're never going to feel good about themselves again. So what I did was switch my self-esteem to being the learner and being able to admit that I was wrong faster than anybody else, identify the right answer faster than anybody else, and put the energy into that. And so in doing that, it's what Nassim Taleb calls an anti-fragile personality. Is that just a a decision you made? One one second, you're like, you know what? I'm going to be the learner. Literally, it's the most binary thing that ever happened to me. It is the one that while you can't really film it because it would all be internal, it's the one thing in my story that was from one minute to the next. It was radically different. God, Tom has got so much passion. I absolutely fucking love it. I'm not even going to lie. I really am inspired just even listening to that clip right now. Thank you, Tom. But he brings up a really, really good point. What do you put on yourself? What are the rules that you establish to build your own self-esteem? If you fail, are you a failure? Is that your identity? Is that who you are? No, 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 no. The truth is that anybody who's been successful is going to fail. So you got to build your self-esteem around not being always right, but being the learner, being able to find the answer being able to do it faster than anybody else can. These are things that you can improve upon because you're never going to be the smartest. You're never going to be the fastest. You're never going to be the best talent-wise, but you can actually develop hard work. And that in of itself will turn into talent eventually down the road. So we talk about mindset. We talk about shifting beliefs. And what if you're sitting there going like, I don't know if this shit really works, Corey. Well, I'm going to tell you a way that you can use your physiology and your mindset to transform your beliefs. And this comes from none other than Wim Hof instructor, Dr. Trisha Smith. This woman is absolutely amazing, guys. She has helped me go through two ice bath submergence where I'm in 35 degrees water temperature under 300 pounds of ice for two minutes at one time and for three minutes the next time. The YouTube video is sensational. But one of the biggest things 
is understanding how you can control your body with your mind, how you can shift your physiology to overpower yourself, to calm yourself down, to overcome fear, to overcome doubt, anxiety. I have used these techniques now for so many different things, and I absolutely recommend you checking out the episode. Check it out in the show notes below, but learn from Dr. Trish and how she used ice and the cold to overcome her fear. I would say the cold. The cold, besides the physiological effects, which we'll get into, um, has really changed my perception on fear and learning actually how to work with fear. And I never in my life imagined, you know, teaching workshops with 20 people, let alone I get to speak on a whims tour where there's anywhere from 200 to 500 people. Um, Again, never thought I'd be able to do that, let alone get up there and, you know, not pass out on the way up. And the ice bath is a tool that you could train those situations in your life, stressful situations, fearful situations. So it, it, that alone, besides the physiological effects has, has made a huge impact on my life. With the cold exposure, we talked a little bit about safety. Um, what are some tips that people can do uh, to, to avoid something like that happening and maybe try this stuff at home? Yeah, the simplest thing is just start with cold showers. Wim's got a great little um, shower challenge on his website that you can print out this little sheet. It basically, you just increase every week. Uh, you start at 15 seconds and increase your time in the cold 15 seconds every week. And you can mark it off. Um, You take your normal warm shower, turn it cold at the end. It doesn't even have to go on your head or your face or your neck because those are a little more sensitive areas. Turn it cold and use the breathing. Let it be cold and then just work on the long exhales, long exhales. And start there and then just gradually work up. When this is something new, and again, I talked about all those miles and miles of blood vessels, all of those actually shift when we get in the cold. So to get in the cold and and keep your organs and your brain alive, what happens is your body does a blood flow shunt. So all of your um, blood vessels in your limbs, your arms and your legs constrict, and then the blood vessels in your organs and your brain dilate. So now you have this warm blood circulating in your most important parts for survival, right? Right. So with that big blood flow, Sean, you've got your blood vessels have to open and close and, you know, all this stuff's happening. And if you're just at room temperature for, I don't know, 30 years of your life and now you're going to go do this, you know, that can have a big impact. So you have to allow the body time to adapt. It's very, very important. You have to earn the right to stay in longer. And with the ice bath, it's not about length of time being in. It's really not. What they're finding now, actually, is that the key is to be cold, you know, below 55, like 55 to 32, and like three minutes. That's it. That's it, right? Well, it's a lot easier said than done. I highly recommend starting off with the 15 seconds and then building up to the ice bath and starting very slowly because it's not always the amount of time you spend in there, but truly about the shift that you can create. When you understand how to correct that shift, you're able to shift your parasympathetic nervous system and change your physiology. So if you're high stress, high anxiety, you're worrying a lot, you're able to calm yourself back down very, very quickly. So now that we've really conquered the mindset, the beliefs, using some of these tips from some of these amazing guests, and we've even incorporated the physiology from Wim Hof instructor, Dr. Tricia Smith. What do you do if you want to start a business? What do you do to be successful on your own? And you know, a lot of people on here are entrepreneurial in spirit, but maybe haven't found the thing for them. So I interviewed Kate Erickson, who is the woman behind Entrepreneurs on Fire. She's with John Lee Dumas, and the two of them created this seven-figure empire. But her journey to entrepreneurship was not that easy. And I loved her story, so I wanted to share it with you guys. 
on this clip from episode 43. Um, but I was wondering if you could share how you got into Entrepreneurs on Fire and specifically what motivated you to become an entrepreneur yourself? Yeah. So uh, what motivated me to become an entrepreneur is finally figuring out that entrepreneurship existed because my background's like very typical corporate, um, go to college, get a college degree, go find a job that has something to do with that degree and uh, climb the corporate ladder. And so that's kind of what I knew. And I had a very like focused vision for that. Uh, success to me was getting pay raises and uh, getting a better title. Maybe someday I'll be a manager, that type of thing. Um, so when I missed out on a pretty big promotion at one of my corporate jobs that I had been working at for a while and, uh, and found out that they actually hired outside of the company, um, to, to fill that position instead of me who had been, you know, working really hard for like three and a half years, never had like a title change or like a movement. And I was at the bottom of the ladder in that position. So like they could have thrown me a bone at some point, but (laughs) that actually ended up being a a really major mindset shift for me and uh, kind of smacking me in the face with like, nobody else going to give you what you want, Kate. Like if you don't want to be sitting in this low level position, trying to like claw your way up this ladder, then why are you doing it? And it was really that experience when, when I didn't get that promotion that I thought there has to be something else out there. I don't know what it is, but like, there's just no way that this is all for me that like the rest of my life looks like this because I, I couldn't accept that. Like I was in, such a bad place mentally, I guess, with thinking that that's what I would do for the rest of my life. That I was like, there, ha- there has to be something else. So started doing a lot of research and that really, um, to answer your initial question, that was my motivation for becoming an entrepreneur. I was like, I can't spend the rest of my life doing this. I'm miserable. Like I hate getting up in the morning. Wow. Kate is so intensely sincere. I absolutely love this. She was just so honest about why she wanted to get an entrepreneurship. And if you are out there right now, hating your job 24 seven, and you're spending years of your life hating it, I challenge you to do something about it. Now that doesn't always mean quit your job, but that does mean start something, start something, start somewhere. And if you're thinking to yourself, where the fuck do I start? Guess what? Kate comes in with a little extra tip on what it takes to build a business that ends up producing seven figures when you start from nothing. Here she is. What do you do to build that audience in the beginning? It's all about ha- it's all about the content. It's about having a content plan and knowing what that content should be. Again, if you don't know what the content should be, start creating something and put it out there so that you know what it should be. Um, And whether that's via a blog or videos or a podcast, you have to have something to offer people for them to want to come to you. You can't build an audience if you're just like, hey, guys, I'm Kate Erickson. People are going to be like, okay, hi. (laughs) But if I say, Hey guys, I'm Kate Erickson. And I have a checklist where I'll share with you exactly how to create a system for anything in your business. All of a sudden, there's probably a certain amount of people that are going to be like, Whoa, I want that checklist. So you have to create valuable, free, consistent content in order to start attracting that audience to to start building that know, like, and trust, to build that authority and that credibility. Again, it could be with an email newsletter list. It could be with a blog. It could be with a podcast. It could be with a YouTube channel. Whatever is going to be right for your avatar. And Kate mentions building an avatar, which is something her and John talk about constantly and is absolutely so important. You got to know who your audience is. You got to know who you're trying to sell a product to. Because if you don't know who your customer is, you don't have a business. Now, I want to switch gears a little bit. I want to go back to the people who maybe, maybe you're sitting here thinking, you know, I've already got a business. I'm, I'm selling stuff. I'm, I'm doing things and I'm an entrepreneur, but I want to know how to make it even better. I want to know what it takes to take it to the next level. And so I interviewed Alex Brown, uh, the founder, co-founder of the Dollar Beard Club, which literally made $10 million in revenue in one 
year. In their first year, they did $10 million in revenue. And so we talked a little bit about the branding strategies, about tapping into the culture of your customer and exactly what you need to do to build something that makes a lot of money. Because guess what? Face it, guys. If your business doesn't make money in a couple years, you won't be in business. So here's Alex Brown. One thing that we really, really did well was we created a brand. And without really knowing it at the time, we tapped into this underlying thing and Anyone listening, I don't know if you've you've noticed this before, but you'll notice this after I say it now. There's this like motorcycle wave type thing that goes on between two guys with big beards, right? It's like a nod or a wave or something. It's an acknowledgement. Hey, I've got a beard. You've got a big beard. Like we're the beard guys at this party or in this bar or whatever. It really, it it took a while for us to understand that that was really what we were selling. Um, And I think Again, anyone listening out there has probably had these little moments, but it's really easy to get caught up in trying to scale and the metrics. And, and these are all really important things of like you know, how much it costs to acquire a customer and what their lifetime value is and the different channels and how they retain and all these different levers. But at the end of the day, it's like anybody could have done what we did. We, you know, uh, anybody and lots of companies and we're friends with a lot of competitors sell great beard oil at great price, prices. And really the reason people keep coming back to us is like this culture that we've created and that underlying current that we were able to tap into so cleverly, um, I think is just like the biggest lesson we learned in the importance of building a brand, building a community. Incredible advice from an incredible human being. He talks about really understanding your customer, building a community, tapping into that culture so that people keep coming back, people become raving fans. And I just wanna jump back to Alex real quick to go over some of the common mistakes they made in their first year of business, even though they made $10 million in revenue, but these are some places that they were leaving money on the table and where you can find some extra profit for your business. So here's a clip from Alex Brown, episode 20. Not knowing what the real product is and not really connecting what the real value of your product and services and how that serves people. Um, right. Another one was actually failure to really pay attention to email marketing. Um, we thought that email was like this dead form of communication. And so we weren't bringing people when they purchased from us, we weren't teaching them how to use the product and talking to them and like bringing them into the club. We weren't doing like card abandonment emails when somebody puts their information in and say they're on their phone and they, they're at the gym and they want to buy it, but they just are like, oh, I don't want to bring my credit card out. It's hitting them with that email two or three times so that you can catch them at a better time to buy, um, capturing leads, and then bringing them through this value ladder. So doing free plus shipping offers or trip wires or lead magnets and getting people in the door and then introducing them to the brand with email. Like It is still the highest return on investment form of marketing. I mean, like there's lots of stuff like Messenger and all these different things that are like coming up and many chat, but email marketing is still like a cash cow for your business. And that was the lesson learned the hard way from us as well is how much money we were leaving on the table with email marketing. You guys ever uh, hear something once or twice or 10 times and then finally it clicks? Yeah, email marketing is one of those things for me that every time I hear it, I'm like, oh my God, I need to do that. And I still forget, which is crazy, I know. But Alex Brown wasn't the only person to tell me about email marketing. You might have heard of a small company called The Hustle. They are one of the fastest growing media companies in the nation. They now have over a million subscribers. And I interviewed the CEO and founder, Sam Parr, who was like, yeah, email is the way to go. Why? Because we don't want to be at the whims of Mark Zuckerberg or any other social media platform. So that is why email marketing is so important. And I want to bring you to our next guest who was an amazing show and it was number 26, the interview with Nick Loper from Side Hustle Show, a podcast show that has well over 5 million downloads. And this guy has tried so many different side hustles. He's even inspired me. He's got a list of over 100 different side hustles you can try today to literally make money today but i asked him after doing so many side hustles after starting so many businesses 
What are some of the common mistakes and how can we avoid it? Because listen, if you guys want a roadmap to success, you want to know how to avoid the obstacles, avoid the detours, avoid the mistakes. So make sure you pay attention. If you want to listen to the full episode, episode number 26 with Nick Loper. But for now, here is a clip for some knowledge. What are some common mistakes that you've seen people make when they're trying to side hustle, um, but they're just not following through? And how can we avoid that? Um, the biggest mistakes, you know, oh, probably the biggest mistake. Well, there's the, there's the there's the meta mistake of like, you know, just kicking the can down the road, like never getting started, thinking of trying to find the perfect business idea, which, you know, there is no perfect business idea. But where a lot of people seem to get caught up is in the, you know, like call it the admin stuff. I was like, well, I need a website or I need business cards or I need, you know, a a business license, which, you know, I definitely recommend getting a business (laughs) license, you know, at a certain point, but like before you, you know, you can, you can figure that stuff out after you have customers. Like don't, don't put yourself through the headache of trying to figure all that stuff out, you know, beforehand where it's like, that might not even be the business that you end up keeping. Like, don't stress about that stuff. How do you stay focused and motivated on these side hustles when they look like they're kind of crashing and burning, but you want to keep pushing? Uh, what's the rule? The rule is when when you come to dread the work, it's time to move on to the next thing. Like, that's been kind of the, the telltale sign for me where it's like, I just, this is, this is not doing it for me anymore. And so there's been a ton of businesses that have either shut down or like just the revenue just didn't justify the you know, the investment either in time or, or effort to, to keep it going. So for me, like, it's really motivating to see results. And so that's where it's like, even as something as simple as like signing up for Lyft or signing up for um, one of the popular ones lately is like VIP kid. It's like you tutor, you tutor kids in China, like how to learn English. And it's just, you know, super simple. And it's like, I don't know, it's, it's empowering to say, okay, I'm making money outside of a day job. Like, you know, I didn't have to necessarily you know, go through, put on a suit and tie, like go through the whole interview process for this. It was just, uh, yeah, I don't know. Like that's very empowering. Empowerment is one of those things that entrepreneurship really gives you. It gives you the feeling that you are in control of your own destiny. You're not reporting to a boss. You are the boss. It also gives you full ownership, which kind of scares some people, to be honest. Some people are so afraid of having full control over their destiny, of having full control over their financial situation, their profession, their job, their career, that they don't want it. And listen, I get it. I understand it. But if you're not one of those people, if you want to be in control of your own life, you want to step up, do the side hustle, take advantage of the opportunity. And I'm always left asking myself one question. How the hell do I do it faster? Right? I mean, you want to do this as fast as possible. We don't want to spend 15 years trying to build success. And I'm not going to say it'll be overnight because it definitely won't. You'll have to put in a lot of work. But how can we increase our speed to become successful? How can we make what we're doing better here and now so we can accomplish more in less time? And I go to Sam Wiegert, who is literally the first episode of Unleash Success. Holy shit, that was so long ago. But got to tell you, Sam, thank you so much for this piece of knowledge that he learned at a very young age from his karate master, basically, who taught him about the business of karate and how to apply intensity to increase your speed for results. Here is Sam from episode number one. How have you become so successful in such a short amount of time at such a young age? What tools and strategies (laughs) did you have? I don't know if people will be watching this, but I'll tell you, like I learned my first martial arts instructor taught me this and it's a very simple uh, little thing that he taught me, but like it just kind of clicked, like it got me thinking at least. So maybe it'll do the same for someone else. He says, Mr. Wieger, and he's a master of others, his name, he's awesome, but he's like a hardcore old school martial arts guy. He goes, everybody is going to make a million dollars. Some people are going to make it in this amount of time. Some people are going to make it in this amount of time. So he did this thing with his hands where he widened them to like, like almost represent like an amount of time, but then he turned it on its head and he goes, 
He goes, but your job is to – it's never the length of time you do anything. He's like widening and shortening his hands, he, and he turns it on its head, and he goes, it's always the amount of intensity you fill that time up with. And and I was just like, ah, I get that. Like it was just like one of those like Mr. Miyagi moments of like, okay, okay. So if I increase my level of intensity um, – I, I think people have different words for that, uh, for intensity. Um, you know, massive action is, uh, is the way Jim Rohn would put it. You know, massive action. You don't just do one call, do a thousand calls. And he, he fills that time, that 45 minutes with a higher level of intensity. So I believe the intensity you bring to something is, uh, is huge. Sam, thank you so much for bringing this to our attention because I couldn't agree with you more. Intensity. You know, you can put in effort. People always ask me, you know, I've been doing the same thing you've been doing. I've been doing the same thing in the gym. You know, I'm working hard. I'm quote unquote hustling for my side hustle. And yet they don't see the results that I get. They don't see the results that other people get. And they go, why? And I finally realized it's the intensity. It's the amount of effort you put in into a confined amount of time. How much effort how much intensity do you bring each and every day if you are bringing 110 percent of yourself to every single moment of every single day where do you think you would be in three months where do you think you'd be in six months or even a year you wouldn't even recognize where you are right now and so i encourage you to apply more intensity into each action into every effort into every goal you have so you build better habits And speaking of habits, I want to bring up Jarek Robbins from episode 38. Jarek is a peak performance coach who literally transformed the way I thought about habits with one simple example when he talked about what it takes to be in the .001%. And this might surprise you because a lot of people are so money focused, but Jarek is life focused. He wants to create the best life possible. And that requires developing a certain set of habits. I'm wondering what was kind of like the best piece of advice you ever got. You know, you're a performance coach. What's one of the best pieces of advice you ever got and something that you took action on? Oh man. Um, probably, I mean, when it comes to performance, learning what it takes to get the results you want. And, and the best advice I ever had was, Average habits will never get you this result. Average habits at best will lead you to average results at best. Meaning if everything works out in your favor and at all the stars align, at best, an average daily habit is going to get you an average result and an average life. And that's okay. That's why it's called average. It's normal. But most people are dreaming of stuff up here, most likely up here doing daily habits that lead here and very frustrated that it doesn't match. And if you can adjust your daily habits and find out what habits actually lead up here and you're willing to do them every day, you'll start to get a love life. And when I talk about the 1%, I say, you know, how many people want to be the 1%? People go, oh my God, you're disgusting. Ew. Ah, I don't want to be a 1%. I said, really? You're telling me right now in this room, you don't want to be the 1% of humans who have some of the best sex on earth. That's what (laughs) you're saying. Ew, the 1%, no thank you. You don't want to be the 1% of people in your church community who give more and support more than anybody else in your community. That's not who you want to be. You don't want to be the 1% of people who are happier than just about everyone else on earth. You don't want to be the 1% of people who, who, who truly show up and give more than anybody else in your community, who support more, who love more, who care more. You don't want to be the 1% of people who are healthier than everybody else on the planet. That, that's where you're going, ew, no thank you. They're or have you allowed money. the media to convince you that it's just evil thing because of the way they've described it using ca- catchphrases called the 1%. Excuse me, I want to be the fucking 1% of people that's healthy, happy, fulfilled, alive. Amen. I want to be the 1% of givers that give more than other people around me. I challenge myself to be that person. And as a matter of fact, I want to be the 0.001% of people who take care of people better than anybody else around me. Part of that's been an inspiration from my dad. He's always been a giver. Even when he had nothing, he was homeless living in the back of his car and he was saving money to give families a Thanksgiving basket on Thanksgiving because someone did it for him when he had nothing. 
over this last 10 year period of time, he committed to donating a billion meals through Feed America to hungry people here in the United States. He's three and a half years in and he's already donated 350 million meals to the cause. It's incredible. He's part of the 0.001% of givers giving more than anyone around. But we fucked this up in our head and we've told ourselves, ew, I don't want to be the 1%. Those are greedy people who are doing bad things instead of realizing the 0.001% or 1% of the planet. You could have the greatest sex life. You could have the greatest health you've ever dreamed of. You could have the, the body you deserve. You could have the love life you deserve. You could have the spirituality you deserve. You could have the, the ability to give more than, than you've ever done. You could have all this stuff. But you got to shift and you got to get aligned with what matters to you most. If you spend your whole life doing stuff because you think you have to or doing stuff because you got to pay the bills, there's no chance. Average, res, average habits lead to average life. You got to step out and, and, and figure out what are those habits. And, and so what are the habits for you? What exactly do you need to do to be in the 1% of the population, to be in the 0.1 or the 0.001% of the population? What are the habits you need to do today? It starts today. If you want to change your habits, make a decision today to do so. And so some of the habits that I really enjoy, that I really like, becoming a person of action. So many people get lost in indecision that they never take any action. If you want to get more stuff done in life, if you want to accomplish more, if you want to have more you know, health and energy, business, money, relationships, fun, whatever it is in your life, become a person of action. Take more action and you'll get bigger results. Another habit that I like to do is I like to ask myself better questions. I like to ask myself empowering questions. So many people limit themselves before they're ever able to even try. I'm not even saying that they limit themselves when they're doing it. They limit themselves before they even attempt to pursue their dreams, their goals. In fact, the self-doubt that they go through, the rejection that they visualize in their mind stops them from even trying so quickly that it's over before they knew it. So one of the other tactics, one of the other habits that I have is to ask more empowering questions. It's like that question, right? Where you say, you know, I wish I could afford that car or why can't I afford that car? And then the rich guy next to you goes, hmm, how can I afford that car? See, that's an empowering question. What can I do to earn that car? What can I do to earn enough money, to put enough value into the world to earn that car, to earn that goal, whatever the goal is for you? So that is what I implore you to do. But if you need something, something concise, a four-step process to becoming successful, well, I give you none other than Tom McElroy, the co-founder of Volcom and the artist who designed the iconic Volcom stone. He has an amazing recipe for success. Here he is now from episode 13 of Unleash Success. I would say chase your passion, take risk, surround yourself with good people and believe in yourself. And I think with those four things, they create luck. And if you enroll and, and, and subscribe to those four things, you're going to become lucky and you're going to be, your luck will become better and better. And uh, that's one thing that, that people have talked to me about over the years. They're like, oh, Macro, you're so lucky. And I'm like, what do you mean? They're like, well, everything just happened for you. And I'm like, bullshit. I've, took amazing risk. I've, I've leveraged everything, but I was super passionate about what I was doing and I believed in myself and I had a network of really good people. Hell things. Of course I'm lucky success, right? And of course. And I always say, you know, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. Mm-hmm. And if you take enough action, eventually you're going to get lucky. Right. Yeah. And if you want to be successful, you have to take those steps to give yourself the opportunity, the luck to be more successful. You know, in every episode, we always ask the guests, what is the biggest action they can take to get the biggest result? What is the biggest bang for the buck? Because I believe in the 80-20 rule. 
I believe that 80% of our results come from roughly 20% of our actions. The key is knowing which actions to take. And to kind of end this, I look at what is the biggest difference in my own life. And I found that, honestly, it's mentorship. Without the mentors, without the help, without the guidance, I would not be where I am today. The key, I asked people for help. I really, really did. But I also was willing to invest in myself. Listen, don't take it from me. But if you'd like, you could listen to John Lee Dumas, Mr. JLD himself, who is the king of podcasts, who has built an empire with entrepreneurs on fire and is literally one of the most successful people I know and why he believes mentorship and investing in yourself is so important. So here from episode number nine, John Lee Dumas. All successful entrepreneurs, they recognize the importance of investing in themselves. They know without a doubt that, hey, they need to invest time, energy, and in a lot of cases, money into their entrepreneurial journey. And it's critical. And kind of part of that investment, I will say, that definitely seems to come up over and over again with entrepreneurs is the right mentor. Because a lot of people get the wrong mentor, and that can really cost you. That can cost you all of those things, time, energy, effort, money. And if you can really just say, hey, I know where I want to be, and then go find that person who is currently where you want to be in life and have that person be your mentor, that's the path that you need to be on. Mentorship is so huge. It has literally transformed my life. And if you are looking for someone to help you, I want to remind you guys that Unleash Success does offer mentorship programs. If you are looking to transform your life, if you're looking to become a better person, a better business person, we can help you. And to end this episode, I was randomly looking through different episodes and I found this one, just an amazing story about grit, perseverance, imagination, innovation in their quest to become successful as an entrepreneur and their willingness to do whatever it takes. I give you none other than a good friend of mine, the CEO and founder of Unum with over 3 million downloads and over a monthly active users. Mr. Dylan Morgan, and how he did everything it took to get funding for his once-in-a-lifetime idea. So, so mine was a little non, like, unconventional. Um, I used to do photography in high school, which is again, I think, a huge value add for Unum in our space that we're in. But uh, so, so um, I volunteered as a photographer for this VC event because VC events are like three, four hundred dollars. I'm telling you my dirty secrets. So I don't, I don't want to see people snaking me on this. <laughs> uh, and so, so I, and then I used my, my, like my dad's flight points cause I didn't want to pay for the flight ticket. So, and then I stayed at my friend's place up in San Francisco. Right. So I did it like literally zero dollars, maybe the Uber cost. Uh, and then the photographer, if you look at it from that perspective, right, if you go to a VC event and you pay for a ticket and then you're a normal attendee, it's very hard. It's still like going up to a bar and going and talking to somebody like, hey, can I interrupt your conversation and let you know who I am? As a photographer, you can do that. So I would go to the I had I studied who was going, who the attendees were, the VCs that would meet the match. And I'll tell you a little bit about what, how much effort you have to put into finding who you want to reach out to and make sure you spend the right time talking to. So I had my my uh, hit list. Right. And I would go in and, and uh, take photos of them, walk around, smile, do little one liners. And it's also nice too, as a photographer, you just the cheesy lines. Hey, how's it going? You, you don't need to have a whole conversation. And then you get to know them a few times, right? It's a two day, three day event. And, and then you start talking about what you do. And that's how I met Shanoa, who is a uh, managing director of Blue Startups. They're like a 20, top 20 accelerator program. And they're based in Honolulu. Uh, they found the founders, Hank Rogers and Maya Rogers and Shinoa. Hank founded Tetris. So like the, the old school Tetris game, right? Uh, what's Tetris? What's, I have to walk out. Corey. I <laughs> actually played Tetris on a game boy for many a road trips. <laughs> this is a game changing game, to be honest. It, it changed my life. It changed everyone's life. Go on. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, so so Chano and I just literally hit it off, and then uh, I I think we had about three thousand users then, and so I it, it was pretty much it, that relationship and that rapport uh, allowed us to get through that application process and become accepted by Blue Startups and an accelerator program. And that's a wrap for the first fifty episodes of Unleash Success. Guys, it's been an exciting year, and I'm even more excited as we've got one of the founders of Sudden Coffee, an instant coffee company that sold over 200,000 cups of coffee, and it tastes better than something brewed in the store. We're also going to be interviewing the brand president for K-Swiss, understanding their mindset shift behind supporting someone like Gary V, you know, going after the entrepreneurs and the young hustlers. I can't wait to share that episode with you. We're going to have many more, so be sure to stay tuned, subscribe to the podcast, and if you enjoyed the show and learned something of value, the one ask that I have is please go subscribe, whether you're on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube. And if you leave us a five-star rating or review, that absolutely helps us get our message out there. Each week, I'm going to continue to interview amazing people, and we're going to break down their tools and strategies to help get you real results. Feel free to visit the website, unleashedsuccess.com, and subscribe to our newsletter so you get updates each week. And remember, knowing is not enough. Knowledge alone is not power. Action is. Because action is the only way you're going to get the results you want in life and truly live the life of your dreams. So take some action, subscribe to the podcast today, and get ready to unleash success in you.